Thank you for being here. We have our third last lecture with new content. Today we're going to be doing an example for a turbojet engine problem. Last class we introduced this idea of turbojets, noting that in order to try to fly, we need to the we need the airplane to generate thrust. Generating thrust in the airplane lets the airplane move forward which lets the wing cut through the air and that generates a high pressure high pressure air underneath the wing and low pressure air above the wing and that's what ultimately gives a plane lift and allows it to stay up in the air. So we talked about this idea of a turbojet engine or at least how we can model it where the center of the engine is this Brayton cycle that we're used to. But it's very special in that the Brayton cycle has a back work ratio of one, meaning that we're only running the turbine so that we can run the compressor. Now, if we had a turbojet that was moving through still air, we would think about this problem as if we're standing on the wing of the plane. So we would move from this stationary frame of reference that makes it look like the jet is moving to a moving frame of reference where we're standing on the wing above the engine where the velocity of the air, even though the air is still in a stationary frame of reference, it's coming right at us in this moving frame. And that's exactly why we have this diffuser so that it can take the kinetic energy in this air that comes into the diffuser and turn that into enthalpy. So we're sort of charging up the enthalpy of the air of the working fluid in that diffuser. So we move to this moving frame of reference and then ultimately we remember that with these turbojet engines we're trying to maximize the thrust that the engine produces and to do that we need to maximize the velocity coming out the end of this turbojet engine. So here we have this velocity out. So what we do in the diffuser is we take the kinetic energy of the air coming in and turn it into enthalpy and the nozzle is the opposite of that. So here we try to have as much enthalpy as we can at state four because we want to convert as much of that enthalpy as we can into kinetic energy or velocity at the exit of the nozzle. At the center of this Brayton cycle or at the center of this turbojet engine is a Brayton cycle and this Brayton cycle has a back work ratio of one. Now, we're doing this so that the turbine is only running the compressor. And this means we're not reducing the enthalpy of the air that comes into the turbine by as much as we could. Instead, we're trying to have as much enthalpy left over at state four as we can because we want to turn as much of that enthalpy as we can into kinetic energy out the back of our turbojet. If we can make all the assumptions that we're used to making in metric units, if we're trying to find power like we would in the compressor or the turbine, we would have m dot times h in minus h out. The turbine power is positive. The compressor power is negative. But because the back work ratio is one, the turbine power has the same magnitude, but the opposite sign of the compressor power. And the same is true when we look at the compressor power being equal to the negative of the turbine power. If when we're adding heat, this works just like it would inside a normal Brayton cycle. We have m dot times h out minus h in. Remember, all this comes from the first law. You can derive it yourself. If we're talking about metric units, the equations for the diffuser and the nozzle are different because they have this kinetic energy term left over. And anytime you have kinetic or potential energy that's left over in the first law, you got to be a little bit weary, right? Your spidey sense starts to tingle and you say, I don't know, the units here probably aren't going to be right. If my velocity is in meters per second, this will give me kilojoules per kilogram when I look up H in the textbook. And this will give me joules per kilogram. So I would have to divide by a thousand. Now, as I've said before, I don't just divide by a thousand automatically in this in these equations because maybe you'd be given velocity in kilometers per hour and then the conversion rate will be different. Instead, I encourage you every time a kinetic or a potential energy term is left over, 
make sure you check the units and get them right. Now it's even trickier when it's imperial units because now we don't just have the normal term VA squared over two, we have to divide by GC just to get the quantity right, just to get energy per unit mass. But this here, when we look up H in imperial units in the textbook, it's in BTU per pound mass. But this, if our velocity is in feet per second, will give us foot pounds per pound mass. And that's good because it's energy per unit mass. But what we want is actually, we want BTU per pound mass. So we're going to have to convert that by dividing by 778, which is kind of close to 1,000. So if you want to remember it that way too, that you, you know, if you get velocity in feet per second, you'll be dividing by something that's, I guess, kind of close to 1,000. But as you know, in imperial units, the conversion factors are never nice and easy like they are when we use the metric system. So we talked about also how we characterize the turbojet engine. Now, I've made note of this a couple of times, and I'll do it again here, that this is not something you'll see on the exam. It's not something you see in the textbook. But for all of these other cycle problems, we've talked about the energy benefit divided by the energy cost. Now here, the energy benefit isn't mechanical power or net mechanical power, it's thrust power. Now we derived an equation last class for thrust power and we would divide that by heat transfer rate in. We're gonna include this equation in the example that we do today, but it's not something you'll see on the exam. If we did this in imperial units, again, this, this equation would have to change because we wouldn't get the quantity right unless we divided by GC. So that's hopefully a bit of a high level uh, review about turbojets. What we're going to talk about now, and I guess for the rest of the lecture, is I'm going to go through a turbojet example. So the kind of thing you might see on the homework, the kind of thing you might see on the final, and what's going to happen here is I'm going to solve this problem both using constant specific heat and variable specific heat. Because remember, once we get those symbolic solutions that I already sort of showed earlier in the lecture, we're going to have these delta H terms and we'll have to ask ourselves, what's the fluid? And here the fluid is an ideal gas. So because it's an ideal gas, we have to say, am I going to fix the states using variable specific heat? and look stuff up on table A22 or A22E, or am I going to use constant specific heat and turn all of those delta H's into Cp times delta T? And in today's class, we'll do both. So here's a problem. I probably took this from the textbook somewhere. What it says is we have a turbojet engine, right? And we have this sort of schematic model for a turbojet engine, right? Where we have a diffuser, a compressor, a combustor, a turbine, and a nozzle. The turbojet's a little funny because the first state here is state A instead of state 1. And I think they do that so that the state numbering in the Brayton cycle part stays the same as a normal Brayton cycle. So it'll be state 1 going into the compressor, state 2 going into the combustor, state 3 going into the turbine, and state 4 coming out of the turbine. But of course on this turbojet, we have a nozzle at the end, at the exit of the turbine. So um, so it doesn't look exactly like a Brayton cycle. Still, we're given some information. So we're told that the plane this turbojet engine is attached to is traveling at 220 meters per second. We're also told that the temperature going into the diffuser is 230 degrees Kelvin at a pressure of 26 kilopascals. Now, you might look at this and say, well, that's weird. Shouldn't it be atmospheric pressure? Right? Why isn't it 101.3? Because this plane presumably is up in the air and you know the pressure from atmospheric pressure is really just the weight of all that air in the atmosphere pushing down on us. So when a plane is way up high in the air, then the amount of air that's pushing down on it there, right? The mass of the air or the weight, I guess, of the air above the plane is less than it would be if you were right on the you know, the surface of the earth here, right? So the other thing we're given is the temperature at state three, that's 1400. Sometimes this will be given as the highest temperature in the cycle or in the engine. So you have to know how to draw these TS diagrams. Notice that this TS diagram, while the shape is correct, the, uh, the numbers here 
don't apply to this particular question, or at least don't necessarily apply. I don't think if you convert this, you'll get these exact same temperatures we have here. The other thing we're told is that the pressure at the exit of the nozzle is the same pressure as the inlet, right? And that makes sense because the pressure of the air coming in, right? That's a jet coming into the diffuser is equal to the jet going out of the diffuser. This is just like the Brayton cycle that's at atmospheric pressure at the inlet and the outlet. It's true here for the turbojet, just atmospheric pressure isn't what you're used to seeing. <coughs> so the other thing you might notice when you look at this is, you know, there's not really a lot of information here on the state table. So here we see we're also given a couple other pieces of information that the mass flow of air going through the jet is 25 kilograms per second. There's a CP for air here. We're using one kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. And we get a compressor pressure ratio, P2 divided by P1. So the pressure after the compressor divided by the compressor before the pressure before the compressor, which apparently is not easy for me to say, that's equal to 11. We're asked to fill in the temperature and pressure data for the whole state table. We'll do this both for, uh, so we'll fill in the state table, the pieces that we need from the state table, both using constant and variable specific heat. We're asked to find the amount of heat that's added in the combustor. We're also asked to find the velocity at the exit of the nozzle. And then I'll also, even though, again, it won't be on the final, but I'll, ask, I'll show you how to calculate the thermal efficiency of this engine as well. So how do we solve the problem, right? So you might get to this state with any cycle, right? And then you've got to ask yourself, is the system open or closed? Or are we modeling the different processes in the system as open or closed because oftentimes, if you get lost in one of these cycle problems, the way to get um, found, I guess, or unlost maybe, is to use the first law. But you need to know which version of the first law you're using. So this looks more like a Rankine cycle than an internal combustion engine because the different processes happen in different components, right? So we'll take open first law analyses for each one of these components. We're going to start at the diffuser because that's where we know the most information. We know the temperature, the pressure, and the velocity of the plane going here at the diffuser. Notice that the problem said that the velocity of the plane was something, but that's in the stationary frame of reference. We've transferred to this moving frame of reference so that we're sitting on top of the engine here. So it feels like the air that's surrounding the jet is actually moving towards the jet at the same magnitude of velocity that the uh, plane is going at, right? So even though, I guess we're assuming here that there's no headwind and no tailwind, that um, the air is still and the jet is moving at a particular velocity. So now the purpose of this diffuser is to maximize the enthalpy. So to take all that kinetic energy that comes into the diffuser and turn it into enthalpy at state one. So we got to remember how to do a first law analysis of the diffuser. So the assumptions that we'll make in the diffuser are first, that we're at steady state. Second, that the diffuser only has one inlet and one outlet, so those summation signs go away. We're going to neglect the change in potential energy. We're going to say that it's adiabatic and passive. So the, the purpose of the diffuser, remember, is to turn kinetic energy into enthalpy. So there's no heat transfer term and there's no power term unless we're told something in the problem. The other thing we've got to remember is that in our turbojet, any state that sort of touches the Brayton cycle part of the turbojet, we're going to neglect the kinetic energy there. So here, the kinetic energy is important outside of our engine at the inlet to the diffuser, but not inside of our, in, of our engine, which is the exit from the diffuser. So we're going to neglect the kinetic energy at the exit of the diffuser. Now, after we do this, we get that H1, which is what we're trying to find, is equal to HA, that's the inlet of the diffuser, plus VA squared over two, right? Now we gotta worry about the units here. This is probably gonna become 2000, but all this is saying is conservation of energy, that the kinetic energy plus the enthalpy at the inlet is equal to only enthalpy 
at the exit because that's what the diffuser does is it takes this kinetic energy and it wraps it up with the enthalpy and turns it into only enthalpy at the exit of the diffuser. So now I'm at the part where I got to ask, what's the fluid, right? I've got an equation here. The fluid is air, which I'm going to assume is an ideal gas. And then I can say, is it a variable specific heat problem or a constant specific heat problem? And I'm going to show, show you how to do it both ways. So if it's a constant specific heat problem, then I can rearrange my equation so it looks like this. H1 minus HA is equal to VA squared divided by 2. Now, anytime I have a constant specific heat problem, what I'm looking for is a delta H term, and I'm going to turn it into CP times delta T. Now, I got to check my units. The CP value I was given was 1 kilojoule per kilogram degree Kelvin. So when I multiply that by delta T, which is going to be in degrees Kelvin, then I get kilojoules per kilogram. This is what I expect for delta H. The problem is when I take V squared divided by 2, if my velocity is in meters per second, then I'm going to get joules per kilogram on the right-hand side of my equation here. So what I need to do is divide the right-hand side of my equation by 1,000 so that it becomes not joules per kilogram, but kilojoules per kilogram. Now, I know Cp. I don't know T1, but I do know Ta, and I know Va. So this is one of the great times in thermodynamics, right? We have one equation with one unknown. That means we can solve this, just doing a little bit of algebra, and I found that T1, using this cold air standard analysis, was 254.2 degrees Kelvin. So that's how I do the diffuser in cold air standard, right, or constant specific heat. If I have variable specific heat, this equation is the same equation, right? It doesn't change from here to here just because I've said variable specific heat or constant specific heat. It's the same equation. But now I'm going to look up these individual enthalpies on table A22. So HA, I'm going to know, just like I knew TA, I can find HA because I know TA. So I go to table A22 and I look it up. And I find that HA is 230.02. Again, I've got this unit mismatch, right? So I guess here I've already converted, right? Because I'm dividing this by 2,000, just like I did down here. So now I don't know H1, but I do know HA, and I do know VA. So I can put this all into my calculator, and I get that H1 is 254.02 kilojoules per kilogram, which is pretty close to what I got. Um, well, I guess here I just found the temperature, but the temperatures are pretty proportional to H in this case when Cp was equal to about 1, right? So here I know this H, but what I would do now is, remember when you look at table A22, anytime you know one of the pieces of information in those columns, whether it's the temperature or the specific enthalpy or the reduced pressure or the reduced volume if we were talking about an internal combustion engine, I can interpolate and find the rest of the information. So here, because I know H1, I can interpolate and I find that the temperature, T1, is approximately 254 degrees Kelvin, which is what I actually found with the cold air standard. And I'm also going to pick off PR1 here and see that it's 0.776. So now I fix the first state. Now I want to go through the diffuser, right? So here I'm going to say that the diffuser is isentropic. And the reason that I want to go through the diffuser here, I'm going to go back a little bit here. Because I want to know the pressure, right? And in this case, I knew the pressure at A, but I don't know the pressure at 1. So how do I get the pressure at 1, right? I don't know. So I found the temperature at 1. I found the enthalpy at 1 either way, right? Whether it's constant or variable specific heat. But I don't have the pressure yet. So what I'm going to use going through the diffuser, let me get back to where we were, is I'm going to use the fact that the diffuser is isentropic, or at least I'm going to assume that it's isentropic, which means that delta S across that diffuser is equal to zero. 
if this is an isentropic process, then if I'm assuming that the specific heat is constant, then I can use this equation, which relates my temperature ratios to my pressure ratios, and also has K in the exponent. In this case, the only thing I don't know is P1. So here, I've got to invert the exponent when I flip it to the other side, and then I multiply both sides of this equation by PA, and I'll get an expression for P1. Now here, I know PA, I know T1, I know TA, and I know K, which is CP divided by CV, or 1.4 for air. And here I find that P1 is just about 37 kilopascals. So now I am almost done here, but if I was doing it in variable specific heat to finish off that row for state one, I'd want to use this expression because the process is isentropic but if it's variable specific heat i can't use k so i can't use the expression with k in the exponent because remember k is cp divided by cv and if cp and cv are both changing i'd have to do some calculus or something and i don't want to do that so instead i use this relationship for an isentropic process with variable specific heat now when i knew when i found out h1 i use that to get PR1, and I can find PRA because I know the temperature at state A. So here, I also know the pressure at A. The only thing I don't know is P1. I put this into the equation, and I get basically the same answer that I got for constant specific heat. So now I'm done fixing state 1. The nice thing about being done fixing state 1 is I've gone through one of the more difficult components. Right? We're more familiar with compressors and combustors and turbines, but nozzles and diffusers are more difficult because they have this kinetic energy term. And when, when I grade these kind of problems, there's two things that people tend to stumble on um, you know, somewhat frequently. Right, The common errors for this type of problem are one, messing up the units with the kinetic energy, and two, forgetting that the back work ratio of the Brayton cycle here is one. So now we're coming into the Brayton cycle. We'll do the compressor first, right? So for the compressor, it's steady state, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic or potential energy changes. It's adiabatic, no friction losses, no heat losses. And we're going to get the expression we'd expect that W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out. And we're expecting this number to be negative. If this is a constant specific heat problem, here I divide both sides by m dot. That's why this is now d little w c dot. And this is going to be cp times delta t. That's just h1 minus h2, right? But we use this constant specific heat assumption. We don't know the power from the compressor. That's one of the things we want to find. But we do know cp. We do know t1. But we don't know t2. So what we need to do here is we need some way of finding the temperature at the outlet of the compressor. If I draw this on a TS diagram, I notice that at least for an ideal compressor, when I go through that ideal compressor, it's a vertical line. So that means this process through the compressor could be isentropic if the turbo or if the compressor was ideal. So that means for the ideal compressor, here we weren't given a compressor efficiency, so we'll just find the ideal compressor. For the ideal compressor, we'll use this expression here. It's got K in the exponent, and it relates my temperature ratios to my pressure ratios. I know P2 over P1 is equal to 11, so that means that P2 must be 11 times P1, or just about 406 kilopascals, if I want to put that into my state table. I use this information and I can find T2. And that means that I've fixed this state in the constant specific heat problem. Remember, when we're doing constant specific heat, we never have to find enthalpy. We're not going to do any kind of interpolation. We want the temperatures and we want the pressures. We need a little bit more when we do air standard analysis. So here, we again notice that this could be an isentropic compressor. And then we'd use the ratio of pressures is equal to the ratio of the reduced pressures. I've set this up so this is equal to R and not 1 over R. I can use this to find PR2. 
Once I know PR2, I can interpolate. And now, because I, I looked at the line where you know 8.536 is in between the two lines, I interpolate and I find H2 to be 505.1 and T2 to be 502. So you notice here, our temperatures are, remember when we went through the diffuser, our temperatures were basically the same. Now we went through the compressor and they're starting to diverge, but only by a little bit, right? Like two and a half degrees on 500 degrees, not that big a deal, right? So now we've gone through the compressor. If this was a real compressor, we would do this same thing, but then we'd have the extra step of doing the isentropic efficiency for the compressor to find the real outlet instead of just the ideal outlet. But now we're going to go through the combustor. So now I know everything about state two, and I'm told that the temperature here at state three is this maximum temperature, which we were given in the problem. For the combustor, it's steady state, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic energy change, no potential energy change, and it's passive. So it is adding heat. We won't cancel out that Q dot term. No friction losses. So this happens at constant pressure and no heat losses, meaning that all this heat is going into the air. So here I again have an equation. If this was constant specific heat, I could again divide both sides by M dot and I get that H3 minus H2 I can approximate as Cp times T3 minus T2. I don't know little Q dot. I don't know C or I do know Cp. I know T3 because remember they told me the maximum temperature in the engine. That happens at state three and I know T2. So in this case, I can just work this out and I get that the heat transfer rate per unit mass of air flowing through the system is just under 900 kilojoules per kilogram. But here I know M dot and the problem actually asked me for the heat transfer rate. So I'll divide this now by M dot and I get that big Q dot if I'm using constant specific heat is 22,392.5 kilowatts. So here I know the heat in is positive. I got a positive number, so that's pretty good. Um, I know that heat rate should be in kilowatts, so the units are right too. So I don't know if my answer numerically is correct, but I can't prove that it's wrong. And that's at least something. If we were doing this with variable specific heat, we have this same expression. We know M dot, I know H2, but I don't know H3. So what I've got to do here is a little bit of interpolation. So here I'm told that the temperature at state three is 1400 degrees. I even used this information when I did it in a cold air standard problem. And I need to use it here too, but I use it in a bit of a different way. So this means because I know T3, it means I can go to table A22 and I can find that H3 is 1515.42 kilojoules per kilogram. And I can also find that PR3 is 450.5. So now, again, I can find big Q dot through the combustor is 25 kilograms per second multiplied by delta H over here, which is just about 1,000, maybe 1,010. And here I see that this, the heat addition, if I do a variable specific heat analysis, is 25,258. So here again, because our temperature differences keep getting wider and wider as we're moving through the engine, our error gets bigger when we're assuming constant specific heat. So these two numbers disagree by more than 10%, which depending on what I'm trying to, the question I'm trying to answer, maybe it doesn't matter, but maybe being off by 11%, maybe that's enough to make me want to go with the more accurate answer here, which I'm going to get from this variable specific heat analysis. So now we've done state A, we've done state 1, we've done state 2, and now we know state 3. That means we can start to go through the turbine. This is the part where it's really important that we use that the back work ratio is 1. Normally, if this was a Brayton cycle, we would be able to say that the pressure ratio across this turbine is just the inverse of the pressure ratio across the compressor. That is not true when we're doing a turbojet engine because we're not trying to get as much enthalpy out of the turbine 
as we can, right? We're only trying to run the turbine so that we can run the compressor. So we need to use the fact that the backwork ratio is one. So here we know the first law for the turbine is going to look just like the compressor, steady state, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic energy change, no potential energy change, and it's adiabatic. No friction losses and no heat losses, right? So we get that, that the turbine power is equal to m dot times h in minus h out, and we know that this is going to be the same magnitude but the opposite sign as the compressor power, which I've written out here. So if I was doing a cold air standard analysis, I know that um, Cp multiplied by T3 minus T4 is equal to the negative of Cp times T1 minus T2. I can divide both sides by Cp and isolate for T4, which is the temperature that I don't know here. And I can use this to find T4, which is in this case about 1150 degrees Kelvin. Now the turbine is isentropic, just like the diffuser, just like the compressor. So I can use my isentropic relationships, right? Because I know the temperature at state four, but I want to know the pressure too. So here I can use this expression. The ratio of the pressures is equal to the ratio of the temperatures times something with K in the exponent. Now I know the temperatures and I know all the pressures but P4. So I put this in and I see that the pressure as I exit the turbine is still 204 kilopascals and not that 23 kilopascals or wherever it was going into the diffuser, right? So here we've got some extra pressure here because we want to have some enthalpy left. If I was doing this in an air standard analysis, right, I would go from this equation, I'd see that the mass flow through the turbine is the same as the mass flow through the compressor, and I'd get that delta H across the turbine is equal to negative delta H across the compressor. I can solve for H4, in this case, 1,264.3 kilojoules per kilogram. Now I can interpolate and I can find PR4, and because I use PR4, then I can use the isentropic relationship, right? The ratio of the pressures is equal to the ratio of the reduced pressures. I know PR3 and I know P3. So then I can find P4, which is 206.2 kilopascals. And then I can also from PR4 interpolate to find, T, excuse me, T4, which is 1,188.5 Kelvin. So now the only component I have left to do a first law analysis on is the nozzle. So when I go through the nozzle, I remember that the purpose of this component is to maximize the kinetic energy or the velocity out the exit of the nozzle. So here I'm going to start with the first law. I'm going to say it's at steady state, that it's one inlet and one outlet. I'm going to neglect the change in potential energy. I'm going to say it's adiabatic and passive. Now here... I know I'm going to neglect the kinetic energy on the inside of the engine, right? Not the velocity at the exit. That's what I need in order to get the jet to go. So that means I'm going to neglect the kinetic energy at the inlet. So this is very similar to, but not the same as the diffuser, because in the diffuser, it was the exit velocity that we neglected. But in both cases, it's the velocity at the state that touches the Brayton cycle on the inside of the engine that we set to zero. So now I'm going to find that V5 squared divided by 2, although we know that it's divided by 2,000, if V5 is going to be in meters per second, is going to be H4 minus H5. So what happens here is we're reducing the enthalpy from state 4 to state 5, and we're turning that energy that's represented by that reduction in enthalpy into kinetic energy. Here, we got to see that our units are correct. So because I want an answer in meters per second, I'm going to divide this by 2,000. If it's a constant specific heat analysis, my delta H is going to become Cp times delta T. I check the units. I've divided by 2,000 already. This is going to be kilojoules per kilogram, and this is going to be kilojoules per kilogram. So I'm adding apples to apples here. I don't know this velocity at state 5, and I don't know the temperature at state 5 either. So in order to find the velocity at state 5, I need some way to find the temperature at state 5. 
When you're in this situation, when you're writing a problem, what you do is you say, oh, I remember, this is an isentropic process. If it's an isentropic process, then I can relate the ratio of temperatures across this nozzle to the ratio of pressures. I know the ratio of pressures because I already found P4, and P5 is the same as PA. So now I know K and I know T4, so I can use this to find T5, which is just under 640 Kelvin. I put that back into my expression up here, and that allows me to find V5. So in my moving frame of reference, V5 is 1011.4 meters per second. And then if I want my stationary frame of reference, I have to take V5 minus the magnitude at VA, and I will get 791.4 meters per second. So this was one of the problems, one of the, one of the parts of the problem, they wanted me to find the velocity at the exit of the nozzle. And if I use constant specific heat, I'll get just over 790 meters per second. If I use variable specific heat, the process is pretty similar. Again, I gotta make sure my units are right, so I divide the left-hand side by 2,000. I know H4, but I don't know H5. So I remember that the nozzle is isentropic. So that means that the ratio of pressures is equal to the ratio of reduced pressures. I know everything here because the pressure at the exit of the nozzle is given. I found P4, I found PR4, so from here I can get PR5. Once I have PR5, I can go to table A22 and interpolate to find H5. Once I have H5, I can put that back into this expression over here. So I'll know H4 minus H5. I multiply by 2,000 and take the square root. And I get V5 for my moving frame of reference is about 1,050 meters per second. If I change that to the stationary frame of reference, I get about 830 meters per second. So that's pretty good, right? So when you go through these uh, problems where air is the working fluid, you're looking for these isentropic processes and usually maybe you'll know temperature and that'll let you interpolate the rest of the row or maybe you'll know the reduced pressure and that'll let you interpolate backwards across the rest of the row or in this case sometimes you're going to be able to find the enthalpy and that'll let you inter interpolate the rest of the row but you're looking for some piece of information that lets you find one of the information in one of the columns on table A22. And once you know one of them, that means you can interpolate to find the rest of them. So now if I have a cold air standard analysis, right, if I'm trying to fill in the temperature and pressure data that we got, right, we went through all these different states and we found the temperatures and the pressures. Now, we never had to find H, right, because in each of these cases, when we're using cold air standard, we never care what the individual enthalpies are because we'll turn the delta H's into CP times delta T. We also found the velocity in our moving frame of reference was 1,011.4 meters per second. In an air standard analysis, we had to fill out all the H values here. Right? We found all of those as we went through the problem. This is That's the part that kind of takes a long time, right? It's pretty tedious. But um, if you know, and again, we're not going to give you on an exam a state table that's this empty, but I can certainly let you find any of these individual states, right? So if you know how to do it all from an empty state table like this or a mostly empty state table like this, then you'll certainly be able to do any individual state that I ask you to fix. Here we found that the velocity in the moving frame of reference was about 1,050 meters per second. So if I'm trying to find the turbojet's thermal efficiency, which you're never going to ask on an exam, but I want to show you how to do it just in case, we get the thrust power divided by the heat transfer in. So if this was a constant specific heat analysis, actually here, the only difference is, well, I guess when we find Q in, right, this would become M dot times CP times delta T. And we would just use the velocity information that we got when we, um, when we did the cold air standard analysis. I gotta make sure my units are right. So here, right, because this is a dimensionless parameter, right, it's a per unit value. So I gotta have the same units on the top and the bottom, so I divide by a thousand. And in this case, 
I got that of all that heat that I put in, about 25% of it made its way into thrust power from the exit from the jet. I have the same expression when I use a variable specific heat analysis, but here I'm going to take the velocity information that I got when I did my variable specific analysis and my Q in value that I'll get from my variable specific heat analysis. And I get a pretty similar answer, but it's a little bit less. So this is about 23%. And actually remember that this is for the ideal turbojet engine where the nozzles, the diffusers, the compressor, and the turbine are all ideal. So in this, you know, if this was a real engine, it would actually do a little bit less than that because all of those things would have isentropic efficiencies. But hopefully, going through this example has given you um, sort of an appreciation or an understanding of how to do these turbojet problems and some more experience about how to solve really any cycle that has air as the working fluid using either constant specific heat or variable specific heat. So that's the end of the material that I have for you, but I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have in our remaining time.